five witnesses and the desperateness that um, of the XJWs that are trying to help people that are still in it, and I can fully understand why, um, is the the advanced techniques that they're using to try and help people awaken. Now, I want to approach this video um, specifically for Jehovah Witnesses and including ex-Jehovah Witnesses because this might help to empower them in their endeavours. But I want to say um, that this problem um, is not specific. It covers the whole Christendom realm of people who haven't got time to fully investigate the scriptures the way they should be investigated to a point when I say the way they should be I mean to a point where they're able to have given themselves a fair go to research the full context of what the scriptures as a whole actually mean. Now, what a lot of people, well, people don't realize that the social sin, theft, rape, murder, etc., right, fueled by just the sinful nature that is within us. But what a lot of people don't realize is there's religiously empowered sin. Religiously empowered sin and I want to try and show what that is and how dangerous it is because I believe it's the primary problem that's causing religious issues within Christendom and cults like the Jehovah Witnesses. Come with me to Galatians that's uh, thesis, Galatians. Oops, there it is. And I'll just bring it onto the screen. The Apostle Paul had come to a point where he was fed up with the legalists that were intruding into the um, Christian work that he was doing in these areas. And he was so infuriated he's coming to this point and this is what I believe a lot of ex Jehovah Witnesses are at this point they're just infuriated with the blindness of the poor people that are following these cults they're um, desperate to try and pull people out but there's this barrier that's blinding people to be able to see what it is that's keeping them held in and what I want to try and do in this talk is show you what that power is. It's a religiously empowered snare on the mind of these genuine people. Let's start in verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, we could actually say, O oh, foolish Christians, O oh, foolish Jehovah Witnesses, O oh, foolish Mormons, who has bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth. Now, bewitched here means who has captivated you? Who has got you in a trance that you should not obey the truth? Now, religion's all about the truth, isn't it? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So what is Paul referring to as the truth here? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. The problem here is the believers have slipped away from the central place of connection, which is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you'll find that in very clearly in the Jehovah Witness movement, but there's the other side in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements, there's an overemphasis on Jesus. There's an overdevotion. I don't know if that can make sense, but they become so blind to um, normal life responsibilities that um, 
a lot of their stuff is unreasonable and even unrational for the for the people that are overtaken by this. Now Paul says, "This uh, I only want to learn from you." Now what you'll find is with a lot of religious people is they're not reasonable. They're not going to bend or flex in any way that's going to take them out of a comfort zone in which they've been indoctrinated in. They will not move away from anything that they feel is a matter of uncertainty or a matter of conflict. They will not do the research in a way that's going to help them to be enabled to understand truth from lies. And then he goes into this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, the Holy Spirit's central to this because you need to surrender when, you follow, when you're being led by the Holy Spirit. You need to surrender everything except your personality, and except who you are. You need to surrender all religious beliefs and all religious indoctrination and all your beliefs and all your thoughts and ideas that you think you need to do or keep or not do or keep to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And he says, are you so foolish? Right? These people are fools. Having begun in the spirit, and in nine out of ten cases, people genuinely begin their journey led by the spirit. Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Now the flesh, and I'm highlighting it here, the flesh, is a very misunderstood word in this context. The flesh here is referring to this. Anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or Jehovah happy or stop him from being sad is the flesh. It's a law. And then he says, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain, which is his compassion towards these people. Now, I'm just going to jump down to verse 10. And I want to make this clear and I'm going to make it simple. I've read these verses thousands and thousands and listened to these verses thousands and thousands of times. And it's not easy to comprehend in a few short reads or a few short listens. I'm talking to you as someone that has spent 20 years listening to the New Testament over and over and over again, eight hours a day. And for here where it says, for as many of are of the works of the law. Now remember, the works of the law in any context, any religious context, Right? Is anything you think you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is a law because that's what the law was about. It was to keep you, to, to show you to try and stay in a position which was impossible for you to keep God happy or stop him from being sad, wasn't it? This is what the law, this is what the law wants. And if you can't do it, God's going to be sad. If you can do it, God's going to be happy. So the works of the law are anything you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And that is putting you under a curse. Now, does that mean you're not, you're not saved? Does that mean the blessing isn't there? No. No. What does that mean? That as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. I'll show you what it means. Now, it's going to help you understand why the Pharisees were the way they were. Even though they were determined to try and follow God, yet it turned out to be the opposite. I'm going to show you why most of the religious people you know and probably yourselves at some stage turned out to be the way you were. 
and I'm going to show you why, why this is happening to 99% of Christians today. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. Now I'm going to scroll down because I've put this on a um, paper because I'm used to writing papers. <laughs> Try and get a doctorate and see, or a PhD and see if you can't write. You'll learn how to write soon enough. Now, and you'll learn how to learn soon enough or you won't pass. Now, we're in Romans chapter 7 now, and I'm down around the verse 7 area. And I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Here Paul's speaking about the law, remember, and I want you to write this down. Anything you think you need to do or not do. There's commission and a mission to make God happy or stop him from being sad is a law, is equivalent to the Mosaic law. It's a religious rule that you have, right? Now, this is what it does to people. This is what this mindset, it can be so subtle, does to people, does to well-meaning, well-intending, kind-hearted, religious people this is what it will do to you you've got to get this please don't block your ears please listen verse 8 of romans 7 but sin now before sin's going to make sense to you sin's not something that you can um mentally mentally have control over for very long because sin is a nature that dwells in you. And that nature needs power. And how does it get its power? If I could show you that, would it be worth a million dollars or more? If I could show you why these good intending religious people are ending up the way they are, evil and, and bent and twisted, all good and polished on the surface, but doing harm, how much would that be worth to you? Please, how much? I'm going to give you the answers now. Now, the problem with this is our sinful nature, our natural human nature, cannot retain this kind of information. It doesn't want to retain it. It wants to reject it. It wants to push it away. It wants us to continue in our religious behavior. But I'm going to read you some verses now. And this isn't a joke, like, oh, oh, this is deadly serious. This has cost me a lot to get to this point of, of realisation. Excuse me. I'm sorry, that was my phone ringing. But I'll just say this, my family's more important than these, these religious things. Just remember that your family is more important and God's not intimidated, intimidated by you putting your family first. Because we're to love each other as Christ loved the church. Right? We're not to love each other as Christ loved the movement. The church was the people. Your family comes before anything, but that's off the point. Romans 7 verse 8, but sin, right? Your sin takes opportunity by the commandment. How does sin take opportunity? How does sin overtake us? Even if we're not sure, even if we don't know it's happening. It overtakes us by anything we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And what's it do? It produces in us all manner of evil desire. Now, how, do, how would Paul have known this? Because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees and all it produced in him was the, the, the intent to force people to try and do the law which they couldn't do to the point where he was murdering people. He was a murderer. He was causing harm. So on the surface, while his intentions were good, underneath he had all manner of evil desire going, going on inside himself. Now, it didn't look that way on the surface, but that's what was going on. How can someone explain how a, a, a well-intending religious leader gets caught in child pedophilia, in theft, in drunkenness, in adultery. Yet the 
for every good, every intention of theirs was good and they've ended up in evil. Because they thought they had to do something or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad. When the answer was Jesus Christ and they knew it. Paul says, I was alive once without the law. Something was right when I wasn't trying to keep the law, but when I tried to keep the law, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I lost my mind. Something overtook me on the inside. I was trying to do good, but I couldn't do it because my sinful nature was over being empowered against me. While I was doing good, I was bringing bad on myself. I was under a curse. That's the curse. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, right? You want to know how sin's getting these people? These well-intending good religious people? For sin, taking opportunity by what? By the commandment. By the thing that we think we need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. What do you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad? Because you need to drop it. Or you're going to be deceived. You're going to come undone. This is how dangerous this is. This is why well-intending, great religious people are falling left, right and centre. And it killed him, yet he was still alive. How did it kill him? Because it overtook his mind. Jump down here. Now, I must say, okay, therefore the whole the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Yes, it is holy and just and good, but we aren't. And the more we try and keep it, the more it fuels our sin. That's what he's saying. Verse 13 of Romans 7. How then was it good? Or how how has then what is good, that's the, the law, become deaf to me? No, certainly not. But sin, the sin in us, our sinful nature, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So if you want sin to get it be empowered, if you want sin to rise up and overtake you, Follow the law. What is your little rule of righteousness? What is your thing you have to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from, from being sad? Because underneath, it's making, it's going to come. It's making you exceedingly sinful. Let's jump down. Paul said, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. I want to keep the law, but I see another law in my members. What's that? The sinful nature. Warring against the law of my mind. This thing will overtake your mind through your good intention and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. It will captivate you. These people, these well-intending religious people are going wrong because they have something deep inside that makes them think they need to do or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad and sin becomes attractive. What are your denominational rules? What are your personal rules that you think everybody needs to keep or God won't be happy or God won't or God will be sad? We've all got to come to the place where we go, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The commandment won't. Your little good deeds won't deliver you from anything. They're going to put you under a curse. Jehovah Witnesses. Pentecostals. Ask Jimmy Swaggart. There's a skyscraper half built in his property. A skyscraper half built. And he says, I tried to, I thought there was something I needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad and I moved away from the truth 
I moved away from the cross and I deceived myself. Religiously empowered deception. But Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. It was Jesus Christ his Lord that set him free. When he fell at the, the feet of the, the Lord. That's how important and critical Jesus is. He's not asking you or forcing you to do anything. He couldn't care less if you stand at the cart. He couldn't care less if you knock on doors. He couldn't care less if you packed up and went on a holiday. He, he paid your price. You're not paying his. Who the sun set free is free indeed. I'm showing you in black and white. This is my daughter, excuse me, she's more important than this. It's Mother's Day here in Australia and my daughter is a florist. She's just filling me in on how she's going. Have you shunned your family and you're not aware of it? Is there something going on inside you that's alienating you from your loved ones? Because they're not living up to your expectations? Have you forgotten about the parable of the prodigal son? You don't push people away. You bring people in. Yeah, have boundaries and all that stuff. But don't ever just push somebody away because of your religious ideals. That's not what Jesus died for. That's not what it's about. I'm going back to Galatians now. For as many... Chapter 3, verse 10. And I've just showed you what the curse is. It's your ideals, your religious ideals. Because you can't keep everything that's all the time that's written in the law or whatever you're saying people need to do. We're not capable of it. Do you know, no one is justified by law in the sight of God. And it's evident. You know why it's evident? <laughs> because you can't do it. The only thing you can do is live by faith, not by behavior, by faith. You've got to surrender. Yet the law is not of faith. Your ideals are not of faith. And the man who does them shall live by them. You can't live up to these expectations. And then here we go again. Christ, not your denomination, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. And what a horrible result that was on him. For it is written, Cursed is everything that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Gentiles are people that aren't Jews. In Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, this is what Jesus has said, asked for us to do in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to him, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Not work, not a job, not something to do. Rest. How worn out are most of you people? trying to deal with people. It's impossible. But Jesus said, come and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy. And, oh my goodness. And my burden is light. That's a different translation. But take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find what for your soul? Rest. For your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, the well-intending religious people of Jesus' day came to him and they said to him in John 6, 28, they said to him, What shall we do? This is for the people that want to do stuff. Okay? That we may do the works of God. So these are the high religious people of that day 
asking Jesus, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? Now this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself answering. Jesus answered and said to them, and I'm closing with this, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. That's the work. Once you've believed, can't you just get on with your life, go light a barbecue, go to the beach, go fishing, go, I don't know, shooting, go play chess, can't you sit and have a cup of tea with the people that you love, can't you enjoy your family? Why do we get all caught up in what we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad when all it's going to do is cause us to be foolish and sinful? There is a thing called religiously empowered sin. And that is where all religious problems are coming from. If you don't know me, that doesn't matter, but I'm telling you, I've put a lifetime into this and it's cost me a lot. And I've listened to so many people reaching out to religious people to, to pull them out of their mess. And this is a theological answer to the problem. I believe it's the theological answer to the problem of Christendom today. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one old life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.